get in touch with. We're going to head and dive in. Uh, today, we'll have two presenters, myself. Um, I'm a partner with uh, Vitell Rippey Kingston. I've got about 25 years of experience. Of, uh, which I've worked in the employee benefit plan area, and I'm currently the HR employee benefit plan practice. And I will be joined today by Rob Davis, who's a senior manager with the firm. Rob, you want to do your introduction? Yeah, pretty similar background to Jay. I've got uh, 15 years of uh, employee benefit plan experience, um, and as we all know, that season's starting up uh, right now, so uh, hopefully everyone will find this presentation pretty timely, uh, given uh, what everyone has coming up here. We're going to go ahead and jump into the slides, and one, one of the things I do want to point out, though, is before we uh, get going too far into it, is you should have received information regarding uh, a CPE credit information sheet as well as a participant evaluation form, which we'd like you to turn in at the end of the presentation. In regards to those seeking CPE, there will be three polling questions that we will provide during the, uh, the presentation. We do the answer to those questions. You will need to write down the answers in the three spots allotted and then return those to us so that you can get credit for this, uh, this presentation. It will be uh, one hour of ANA CPE for those who uh, need to record it in manner. And also, I would like to let everyone know that the opinions that you'll hear today are of myself and Rob's, are our own, not necessarily those of the firm, the well, or the AICPA. And most of the information that we have obtained today that we're presenting to you come directly from the Department of Labor and or the AICPA. Uh, for today's agenda, some of the things we're going to attempt to uh, communicate and that hopefully you learn about will be the DOL regulatory initiatives that are, are currently on tap. Highlight New and accounting auditing requirements effective for this year, discuss issues on the near horizon, and then provide you some uh, the opportunity to ask questions and ask the experts, as we say. Just some fun facts to get started. Uh, interestingly enough, ERISA celebrates its 50th anniversary this year. Gerald Ford signed the ERISA into law back on Labor Day in 1974. It's kind of scary that it's been around that long. And the, the first Form 5500, which is all near and dear to us, was filed in 1975 with an annual audit requirement. Uh, another slide I think that is very interesting for folks to uh, to pay attention to and where we see the changing environment is uh, the, the slide here that shows the growth of ERISA plan audits. And this is just for those plans that are above 100 participants, but you can see the change uh, back in 1975. Seventy-five, where the majority of those plans were defined benefit plans, and there were just a few defined contribution. To where we're at now, where it's uh, three to four times as many defined contribution plans. And and as firms get out of defined benefit plans, we expect this to continue. Uh, these smaller organizations, it's easier for them to set up simple plans and other 401k type related plans versus defined benefit. And we expect that trend to continue as we, we move into the future. Um, some of the things that uh, we're working as a profession, in particular AICPA, is, is, is in regard to advocacy with the DOL. We've been having meetings with the DOL, um, you know, focusing on the audit quality that they've gone through and some of the studies they had over the past few years. Um, you know, they're trying to address their issues, and we're going to get to that in just a little bit in some of the presentation slides. Also, talking about excessive revenue sharing arrangements, uh, they're starting to pop up in certain benefit plans, and the DOL is starting to have concerns around those. And we're working with them as to way uh, which we can work uh, through that with both um, from the outside as well as the regular accounting side. And then in general, the DOL is starting to have some different interpretation of auditor independence and making sure that auditors understand what those rules are, and those of you uh, in industry understand what the auditor's requirements are, and you can make sure that they meet those requirements. Uh, we're also uh, attending meetings with the Department of Labor Office of the Inspector General, and in particular, a couple of their very key issues are one is the hard to value investments, and this really gets into uh, is uh, if you think about some of the financial statements to get attached to your uh, uh, benefit plans to the 5500, you'll see level one, level two, and level three. And what they're referring to here are the level three uh, type investments because they're becoming very hard to value. You know, in some cases, they're um, uh, ship shares in an organization uh, the for itself. Maybe it's in real estate or maybe it's in a independent uh, limited liability partnership that the, you can't get your hands around what the value is. Is trying to understand the easiest way to value those 
Rose and get proper education. I believe Rob's going to talk a little bit about that in some of his slides later. And then also just uh, limited scope audits. What do they mean? What really is limited? And, you know, as the definition stands today, it really only focuses around the investments held in a plan and that you can get a certification from the fiduciary, i.e., if it's held with a bank or if it's held with an investing institution, can they give you a certification around those investments? And if so, then you can participate in a limited scope audit. If not or a material portion of the assets are not subject to that certification, you are subject to full scope audit. And uh, the Office of the Inspector General wants to put a little more focus on that and make sure that the uh, rules are being followed properly. Uh, some of the overview of some of the other things we'll discuss in regards to the uh, uh, DOL is the SA audit quality initiatives, uh, some of the emerging issues, uh, report compliance initiatives, regulatory update, and then just generally some DOL resources to hopefully you have a good takeaway. Uh, just some, some facts to share with you, and I know some of you folks in, in, in industry, this may not be a, something near your heart, but I think it's important for you to know because one of the issues that's popping up uh, Left and right, if you will, the deficiency rate is unacceptable at 32%. And one might think that, you know, why do I care? Well, the reason you all might care is if it's determined that an audit is determined to be deficient, it will coincide with the filing of the 5500, and then that said 5500 is now considered to be delinquent. So if someone like yourself may be concerned, and you may want to pay attention to some of these uh, uh, next few slides and have communication with your auditor as to what they've done and what their practice is all about. Uh, but there's large variability depending on the employee benefit practice size. What they've found is firms with large practices, you know, tend to meet the standards, and large is right now defined as those with 25 plans or greater. And firms with limited practices are having a much higher rate of deficiency. And, of course, they've got what they call the dabblers, which are folks, uh, audit firms who have maybe one or two plans all they audit. They're really not necessarily familiar with the rules, and the, the delinquency rate is extremely high with, with those plans. Uh, we will do the first uh, polling question at this point. Um, so, you know, mark it down and make sure you write this down. And the question would be, what year did Gerald Ford sign ERISA into law? Uh, 73, 74, 1975, or 1976? And I think you all know that the answer to that was on the slide a few slides ago. It's B, 1974. So make sure you write down 1974 as the answer to the first polling question. Moving to the slides, uh, you'll see uh, we're at uh, slide number eight, ERISA Plan Audit Universe. And just to kind of give you some background as to the, the vast size of these, there are 80, almost 83,000 plan audits in existence today. And that, remember, only for plans with over 100 uh, participants. That doesn't even include those that are under 100. Uh, well, it is considering, you know, modifying that rule. Um, not heavy discussion on that, but it is a consideration. The deal is definitely considering doing more research and doing more uh, inspection of plan sponsors in regards to those that have less than 100, as they're finding that the delinquency rate of those just filing requirements are, are drastically higher than in years past. Almost 7,400 CPA firms doing audits and 6.3 trillion in assets that are subject to audit. This next slide, slide nine, really kind of tells the tale, and it's a tale of two worlds. And, and this, uh, some may want to have a discussion with your auditor about is which category they fit in. But you can see on the left, 50% of plan auditors only do one or two plans. Just 6% of all the plans are audited, and only about 2 million participants. So it's interesting that so many plan auditors. But if you go off to the other side, just 1% of all plan auditors are doing more than 100 plans. 2% of all the plans audited and 91 million participants. So see there's a drastic difference, and this is what part of the DOL is concerned about. And, and I, you know, back to the, the word dabblers, the, the folks on the left are who they're kind of considering dabblers. And do they really have the necessary training and understanding to be able to do uh, good audits on, in this world? Some of the themes for deficient audit work, and I highly recommend that you talk to your auditors about these areas to see if these are concerns they have, what do they affect the current plan that you have, uh, what issues should you be addressed, what things can you do to make their life easier. So they have found is over-reliance and over-reliance on SOC 1 reports um, uh, around operating controls. 
part of the issue there is is understanding that just because you got a SOC 1 report, there is probably user controls that need to be assessed at the entity level. At times, uh, plan administrators and fiduciaries of the plan tend to ignore those. Uh, you step back, talk to your auditor about that to make sure that those deficiencies aren't you know, subject or part of your plan. Uh, performed by actuaries and appraisers. Uh, this also gets into a little bit of the level three that I had mentioned earlier. Uh, part of the issue is assessing the work of those those outside individuals, those third-party uh, experts. Uh, auditors need to assess that they have the required skills to conduct the uh, process they're doing. Many times these folks are hired by uh, the sponsor without even mentioning anything to the auditor and then expect the auditor to rely on their work, and then the auditor gets in there and finds out that the individual doesn't have the necessary credentials. So again, if you have a situation like this, I highly suggest you work with your auditor uh, to make sure that the actuary or the appraiser meets the, the required credentials. And then uh, the, the, the final one on over-reliance is predecessor auditor, auditor work. Um, and this is where you see audit plans switch from one audit firm to another. And what happens is the, the new auditor does not necessarily go back and do enough to gain an understanding of what the predecessor auditor did in regards to the comparative financial statements and the previous history of the plan. Uh, and what we're finding in a, in a number of cases is uh, the presser auditor maybe didn't do enough work, and the successor auditor did not do an inquiry to determine that maybe there were some issues and potential restatement that needed to be put in place. And some of these are being found as part of these DOL investigations. Uh, some of the other things that have come up as part of efficient work is lack of skepticism. Uh, part of the issue is you know, a lot of folks go, hey, what can go wrong with the benefit plan? I don't understand. Everything is subject to the controls. All the investments are held on the outside. Well, all that's true, but you still need to remember there's benefit payments, there's, you know, participant data that is involved, you know, is, is proper payroll withholding being accounted for, and sometimes auditors aren't always as skeptical as they need to be. Uh, sometimes checklist mentality and complacency comes into play. Um, too easy for auditors sometimes just to go down a checklist, start marking things off, say, I did that, I did that, I did that, and sometimes uh, we're finding out that they moved a little too quick and have... Uh, uh, maybe done uh, checked on, uh, checked on some things that they haven't done, and just lack of audit experience. And again, this gets back into the concept of the dollars and those who maybe don't have a robust practice. You don't deal with enough of these. It's hard to really gain the experience that you need to really be able to uh, uh, to requirements of the, of the rules and laws. Um, Refros agrarious work is being sent over to the AICPA Ethics Division. Again, this is from DOL. They will also send uh, information to the state boards of accountancy. And as you can see, the ethics division had over 800 referrals in the last uh, last phase. And that seems like a, a lot to me because it is a lot. And I hope you would think the same thing. Uh, the ICBS focus on rehabilitating those practitioners, uh, really focusing on what they can do different. A lot of CPE is, is, is offered. Uh, there is obviously a national training conference that's held in May. And I know most of the state uh, societies also holds uh, one day CPEs, usually here in April and sometimes in May. Uh, it's some of the things you might want to consider as looking at as well. Uh, you can see there's been over 100 referrals just to the state boards of accountancy as well. So, um, you know, it, it continues to be a concern, but the DOL is not backing down and they keep pushing forward. Um, hopefully they can get the uh, deficiency up higher than that 32%, uh, but we'll have to see. Um, some of the other the uh, quality study uh, things that they're going to be performing in the future or, or currently doing is that they are doing what's called a statistically based uh, nationwide study. And they're trying to establish a baseline so that they can say, hey, look, this is what we think a minimum model should be and it should be about. And therefore, they can then compare. Uh, so we do their DOL inspections. They're not constantly recreating the wheel. Uh, they want to use a stratified sample. And they're going to be doing a sample size of about 400 firms. And we've got a slide coming up here where I can do that and show you that breakdown. We are in the midst of this uh, this uh, statistical sample that the DOL is going through. It started back in October of 13. We'll run through uh, September of this year. Uh, they were reaching out to fiduciaries and plan administrators uh, if a plan is picked because uh, they will need the authorization of, of you all uh, so that they can access the work papers of the, uh, of the auditor. Please respond uh, as quickly as possible to that because it helps with the uh, expedition of the process. If delay to your response or no response, obviously the DOL gets very suspect and starts to think that there's obviously a bigger issue at play with this plan. 
So in your own uh, sense, you want to respond quickly. And obviously, the reviews are performed by the Office of Chief Account out of their offices. So it's a program. Some of the things that they're focusing on, if you move to slide 13, um, you'll see some of the firm qualifications they're focusing on is peer review, uh, making sure that uh, you're complying with the state peer review licensing requirements, uh, petitioners in the states that the peer review is required, and evidence of acceptable peer review, as well as licensure. And I think the key to licensure is something that a lot of us uh, don't think too much about. You know, for instance, we're in Ohio. We do a number of plans in Ohio, but you as uh, those uh, plan sponsors and fiduciaries, you need to think about situations where maybe you have the corporate work, you've got an hourly plan or a salary plan here in Ohio, but maybe you did an acquisition in another state. And with that acquisition, you left that 401k or that profit sharing plan in place, and you're just doing the audit, uh, say Alabama, or if it's in Missouri or whatever state it may be in. You went ahead and changed and had your current auditor here in Ohio, for instance, do the audit. Is the auditor here in Ohio meeting the requirements of the state that that plan is in? Have they looked at the NASBA website to ensure that they've got proper auditor mobility? Uh, I think that's something you may want to ask your auditor to make sure that they're meeting those requirements. Uh, if you haven't, that is something you need to be uh, concerned about because it could uh, lend a situation again where that audit then is considered to not be appropriate because they didn't have the profiling requirement and therefore then your 5500 could be considered delinquent. Uh, here's just a quick uh, mention of the 400 plan audits, how they're trying to go about doing it. It is going to be based off the 2011 Form 5500s. Uh, there are different, uh, six different strategies you can see, uh, you know, one to two plans, three to five, and so on. Uh, one that they're going to pick in each of the two lower strategies and then five in all others, uh, and hopefully getting to the point of getting 400 total. I can say I know at this point our firm has not yet been contacted, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised if we weren't. Um, but that is the process that they're going through. In, in the compliance reporting, um, how the process will work is if this plan is picked, you'll have an opportunity as the auditor to supply the information and supporting work papers to the DOL. They're accepting all forms of work papers uh, except for original. So if it's computer based or if it's paper based, whatever it may be, uh, put in place and get it off to the DOL. Interesting thing, and this is really kind of a, a first time they've come out and officially have said this that all undocumented work is considered efficient work. So you can't get away with saying, oh, oh, we did that, but we just forgot to write it down. Or we forgot to document it. So they're, they're really going to hold the feet to the fire of the auditors to make sure that that work is considered uh, documented and therefore uh, not deficient, uh, which then also, again, could lead to possible rejection of the 5500s if it is so egregious. Um, the demographic will be around a questionnaire. There will be two tiers of which they'll look at both the flow level information as well as engagement-specific information. And then to try to uh, tie that back to particular things such as how much training did the firm do, what are they charging for fees, and what's the supervision from the audit partner, the audit manager on the engagement. And in a couple of them, I mean, you know, their belief, and I think we can probably get to this pretty easy, their belief is those firms that tend to do more training will have less deficiencies, those that do less training will have less or more deficiencies. Uh, there's also a concern about fees. Uh, they believe that too many firms are using these as lost leaders or or um, uh, too many uh, plan sponsors and fiduciaries are looking at as necessary evil and strictly compliance and pushing back on fees. And what happens if the fee is too low? Are the auditors then cutting corners to make sure they get the work done to meet the fee that they've agreed to? They will take a look at that on situations where uh, they have found uh, errors of compliance and see that was the fee too low and was that maybe a reason that you know, things got cut. And then obviously supervision as well. Uh, was the, the, the properly supervised from an audit perspective? You know, was the partner involved? Were they involved from the beginning and the planning and even the discussion all the way up through did they review the financial statements? Um, some of the urging issues and some of the things that uh, we're moving into in the next few years that we need to be kind of paying attention to is uh, the internal control environment. Um, you know, one of the things they notice is a lot of uh, a lot around lost participants. Um, as as participants away from the plan, uh, maybe didn't take their they left the company. They didn't take their money with them. The money is still within the plan, and then all of a sudden it comes time to pay it out, and the plan sponsor doesn't know how to get a hold of them. Uh, what around those situations? Um, you need to make determination. So you know, best thing would be as someone leaves, 
on the money to take with them or contact with them. Make sure your, your records are up to date with everybody that you have inside your plant so you know how to get a hold of them. Uh, other area that's becoming a, a bit of a concern is uncashed benefit payment checks. Um, I know this kind of sounds a little crazy to people, but certain folks will get a, a benefit payment to them, and for whatever reason, they don't cash the check. Is subject to um, you know, uh, just like any other uncashed funds check, uh, it's not income to the plan when it's not cashed. Uh, there are other rules that need to be applied, so it's something that the DOL is paying a particular attention to, as we will as part of the audit process. A risk of spending accounts, which we're starting to see some of those pop up into plans, and uh, and basically is is specific plans with inside a, a plan where uh, be. Situation is there were forfeited monies that got put back into the plan, and the plan sponsor is keeping that back as a forfeited account. Um, you're know, really not supposed to be doing that. That money is supposed to be spread out to the to the plan participants and should not be left in that type of forfeiture account. Now it can be used to pay other bills, such as fees to uh, you know the investor or fees to the auditor or lawyers, whoever they may be. But they really shouldn't be held into a, a spending account and carried for a period of time. Uh, they're also going to be looking at uh, some of the things require communications with the client from the auditor perspective. Uh, what we're finding out is many auditors are not going through the proper uh, independence communications as well as proper uh, standards, in particular 260, as well as in the engagement letters. A firm goes through a process uh, and ensures that those letters get issued. If you have a plan that doesn't have any of those letters coming your way, you may want to talk to your uh, your auditor. And then. Compliance with the new clarity standards. Uh, make sure that the auditors are, are addressing those standards. They found that uh, a number of folks maybe applied it to their regular audit practice, but they did not necessarily apply it to their benefit plan practice. And the DOL will be face, uh, excuse me, facing a little uh, on that particular area as well. Some more specific issues that have come up, and I think most folks are familiar with some of these, is the fee expenditure disclosures that came out last year. Uh, back in 2012, but applied last year, you know, bring a lot of transparency to the process of selecting and your plan service provider. And really, what this gets to is contracts with the plan to our contractual parties. And, and obviously, the most notable ones are those handling the investments of the plan, because what usually happens is those folks handling those investments are charging a fee, and that fee is being charged to the plan participants. And they make sure that those fees are, are reasonable. So obviously, you need to uh, establish a comp comprehensive disclosure process for those fees. Uh, she applies to anything over $1,000, and it went into effect back in uh, July 1st of uh, 2012. So if this is news to you, uh, I suggest that you talk to your auditor right now and make sure you, you understand where you're at with these issues. Um, hopefully, you've got an investment committee that is looking at these. They should be getting looked at on an annual basis, uh, preferably uh, any time that you meet with your investment advisors. So if it's with a bank or if it's with an investing institution, you're having that conversation and, and doing an assessment as to the reasonableness of those fees. Um, uh, some that have come up uh, that would allow for an exemption would be uh, uh, if responsible fiduciary such as yourself enters into a contract not knowing that the contract service provider had failed to comply with the disclosure rules. Carl, you do have an exemption, uh, but you need to notify the DOL uh, uh, as soon as you know about that of the of the failure, and I've included here a slide how you can go about doing that online. So this would be a good reference for you if you end up in a situation like that. So if you're a fiduciary of the plan, you find out that your contract service provider had not been uh, providing the services or didn't disclose it to you properly, you do have an out so that you're not held accountable for it. Uh, some of the consequences of uh, noncompliance of these, you know, obviously, uh, you know, if it's determined that they're not reasonable fees, uh, they are required to be included in the prohibited transactions. So hopefully uh, you, you will have minimally your auditors asking the question, do you go through the process of making a determination? Uh, obviously, if you're answering no to that question, well, that, that's a concern. But if you are, hopefully you can prove a process that you went through to make sure they are reasonable. And then if they are not reasonable or you did determine that they were not reasonable, they would need to be included as part of the prohibited transaction disclosures. Um, a situation where a responsible plan fiduciary violates uh, uh, 406A1C uh, by participating in a uh, prohibited transaction, that would need to be disclosed as well. And then obviously any service provider that's considered a disqualified person under the rules uh, would be subject to certain excise taxes. Uh, the basic 
recommendations for service provider making compliance disclosures, but you know the big key would be uh, you know making sure you get the proper disclosure under the uh, um, transactions as well as filing it under Schedule D. I need compensation for those groups in the Form 5500. Obviously, if you have any questions, feel free to throw those away on that. I know mean, it's a lot of stuff, but I think most folks have uh, addressed that over the last couple of years, but the DOL is now starting to take a uh, look at it because they've given people the opportunity to get the disclosures uh, in place. Uh, the changes that will be occurring this year to the 5500, um, I do have a, a copy here. Where there's an advanced informational copy that you can go to the DOL website and get, but uh, one of the things would be if you have a Form 1 compliance information, um, it sets forth the information that need to be completed for all welfare plans. So if you're a welfare plan out there, you need to pay particular attention to the Form 1 compliance. Um, the, the plan part of the Form uh, 1 are now required to be formed regardless of the plan size. So I think it's very key as a lot of times the people felt they had exemptions. So if you are one of those folks, please, no matter the size of your plan, please pay particular attention to these rules and go and, and, and speak with the folks that are going to be preparing your 5500 to make sure that those are handled appropriately. Uh, other things, uh, and these really uh, relate to uh, pensions in particular, the PBGC, the Pension Benefit Guarantee, uh, Guarantee Corp, uh, has a new filing requirement under Element 5C, has been added to Line 5 of Schedules H and I, uh, so you make sure you pay particular attention to those as you get those um, uh, filled in as part of your 5500, and those uh, relate to the pension uh, uh, folks out there. And then, of course, another one is under the uh, Schedule SB that relates relates to the MAT-21, and again, this is a pension issue, and those folks, uh, if you remember under MAT-21, uh, allowed folks to have a different method to calculate their minimum contribution to the benefit plan, and there are certain requirements that are subject as part of that under the uh, Schedule uh, SB. And last but not least, under the DOL side, uh, some resources for you. As you can see here, uh, there's a website that I've given you. You can go, uh, go there as well. Uh, the phone number for the chief accountant, or the phone number for the uh, Office of Regulation and Interpretation, and plus uh, the DOL eFast Help Center uh, for regarding the Form 5500 and related schedules. So, uh, Lowe's, um, actually, we're going to go ahead and do another quick polling question. It was just on this slide we just talked about. Uh, you know, basically, wh which of the following are ways that you can contact the DOL? A, the website at DOL.gov. B, call the Office of Chief Accountant at 2693-8360. C, Office of Regulation of Interpretation at 202-693-8500. Or DOL EFAS Help Center at 866-463-3276. And obviously, the real answer would be E, which is above. So your polling question number two answer is E, all of the above. Uh, with that said, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rob Davis as he will uh, take it from here. Thanks, Jay. Uh, I'm going to get into a little bit more uh, specifics in terms of accounting and uh, on the accounting uh, side of things and then from an audit perspective as well. Uh, in accounting uh, considerations out there, really, uh, items that we'll talk about today that uh, may have an impact on uh, many of you out there, although I'll say that these probably are not overly significant in, in relation to what you have going on. Uh, the items deferral of uh, certain fair value disclosures, I think that uh, as I've been uh, sitting in uh, these uh, type of presentations, fair value has uh, always been an item that's on here, and I think that will continue. However, as we'll get on the next slide, uh, actually, is a deferral, so uh, maybe a good thing for uh, some of you on the call. Another item is liquidation basis of accounting. For any of you that may be in that situation, uh, get into some of the changes that, that, that have happened there. Uh, for item uh, again, deferral of certain value disclosures. Uh, this is an indefinite uh, deferral that's out there. And what this does is it relates to plans that have their own equity securities included as part of the plan uh, and would relate specifically to private companies that would be out there um, or, or not subject to SEC filing requirements anyway. Uh, bottom line of this is if you do have uh, a plan that has uh, equity securities uh, for either your own company or affiliated companies, and there's definitions 
questions within this pronouncement uh, for what affiliate uh, entities that really means. You're not required to, to disclose the information uh, that would be related to this. Uh, so that again, that uh, could be a good thing. Again, I think that they took a step back and said uh, this does not make any sense uh, for a private company to have to put uh, this confidential information that would be out there. Uh, again, this is an issue 2011 04. The other point I'll make on this deferral is this does not change the other requirements that would be out for level three investments. Those requirements would still remain in relation to. to Disclosing all the unobservable uh, uh, inputs and uh, disclosing the, the level three roll forward. So uh, that again not change. The only change really is for uh, your private equity uh, that uh, would be included within your plan. And this effective upon issuance, which was uh, July 8th of 2013. So this is effective now. And method of accounting. Uh, this has always been uh, something that's been out there that has uh, had an impact on, you know, many plans that we've audited. Uh, but uh, this is something that really has been clarified uh, in terms of when and how to use the liquidation method of accounting. Um, and the first bullet on there really talks about when uh, liquidation would be used. And, and, and the term that's used is imminent, which means it's been approved by those in authority. Uh, it's been imposed by other forces. So, again, there's been clarity in terms of when. In relation into how uh, there's been a change in terms of the requirements uh, for both uh, initial measurement and subsequent measurement, uh, and there's additional uh, presentation matters that are now required uh, that is part of uh, the standard. Uh, this is uh, uh, effect beginning periods after December 15, 2013, so uh, 2014 now, now but again for last plan year for uh, any plans ending December 31st, 2013. Early adoption would be permitted. This slide, uh, FASB advocacy on uh, benefit plan accounting and reporting. Uh, Audit Quality Center, which is a subset of the ICPA, uh, in working with the FASB, uh, has finally, I think, recognized that uh, these benefit plans uh, are a little bit different than, uh, you know, the audit plan sponsor and, and have really a lot of unique characteristics that would be out there. Uh, so as part of this, that they've gone through a process, um, and there's a 26-page memorandum out there that uh, identifies uh, areas that uh, are specific to employee benefit plans. Uh, and and it, at the end of the day, what they're going to do is they're taking a research project on here to focus on uh, the, the financial report issues that are unique to employee benefit plans. But what they found is there is a lot of conflicting, redundant, or irrelevant uh, standards that are out there. Um, but on the other side, there's a lot of standards out there that were incomplete uh, due to a lot of the specialized nature of, of the plans that are out there. Um, issued this December 12, 2013, in an alert. And uh, if anyone has any questions on that, uh, feel free to, to ask us uh, or uh, uh, go out there to find that discussion memorandum. <clears throat> Moving on to auditing considerations. Uh, Jay touched on some of these at a high level, but the really of the hot buttons and focus points out there that are out there for auditors. So, uh, you know, we'll be uh, focusing on a lot of these, but uh, you'll probably, if you're on the other side, uh, you feel different questions and uh, maybe some, some additional uh, things you have to do on your side as it relates to, to, to these uh, hot topics that are out there. You know, as I mentioned, fair value measurements and disclosures, there's just a continual focus on three investments, as Jay talked about before, what those type of uh, investments are. You know, those contracts, uh, investments with private companies. And really the point that's out there is trying to make sure that there's a better understanding uh, of what those are. There's uh, the, the relevant disclosures that need to be out there. And really on the valuation side, as Jay mentioned before, uh, you know, coming up with a valuation for these type of investments can be very difficult. Uh, specifically, we uh, use a, a firm specialized in completely valuation of these type of investments. Real employee benefit plan audits that comes into play, uh, you know, full scope audit. But uh, you know, really make sure that those valuations are correct. And again, all the disclosures are out there. Uh, well, all of this, Jake, and also a couple of things to keep in mind on the disclosure side relating to fair value measurements is when you have movement from one level to another, uh, you make sure that you uh, have disclosure about why that movement occurred. 
um, what the dollar amount was for the, or, or is it in the movement because it's one of the things that's been a misnomer. And then if you do have level three disclosures, it, you have to reconcile that from the prior year to the current year. Purchase, sales, income, and, and expense are related to that particular investment or, or set of investments. That's a good point, Jay. And I think one of the difficult things that we've had uh, in trying to, to meet the disclosure requirements, and it takes a lot of time working with the plan sponsor and, and the TPA and, the, and really the investment side, is what they call uh, unobservable inputs, the factors that uh, really have been used uh, by whatever firm's uh, uh, put valuation out there and make sure all that information is disclosed. It's a bit subjective, but uh, there's uh, quite a bit of uh, requirements that's out there for those disclosures and a very difficult uh, to try to get your hands around all the information and then uh, can frustrate at the same time. So just to, again, if you're sensing some of that frustration and trying to get some of that information, that's why it's just, again, uh, a very hot button that's uh, out there on the disclosure side. Uh, service organizations, uh, Jay talked about this a little bit in his part, uh, you know, in the use of what we call SOC 1 reports. Uh, I think what's what's being found out there a lot of times is uh, incorrect reports are being used. Uh, there may be a third party that's being used, but there may be multiple SOC 1 reports that's out there. There may be a separate uh, SOC 1 report for IT controls versus the various other parts of why you're using that uh, service organization. Uh, so uh, making sure that uh, uh, those reports uh, are being maintained and the requirement uh, for the, the plan to be reviewing uh, the controls that are out there and making sure that uh, uh, they're able to rely on those SOC 1 reports. Uh, for many of you, you know that is out there as well. There's a section within those SOC 1 reports that uh, talk about uh, user controls. Those would be the controls that are specific uh, to the company as part of their reliance on that service organization. Uh, another area around service organization that's been an issue has been, been the dating of the service organization reports. For instance, if you're a December 31st year end uh, plan, um, you have to be careful that that report you get for the SOC covers a significant portion of your year. So, for instance, if the report is only dated at the end of April, that eight-month difference, uh, that not be satisfactory. Kind of the rule of thumb is that it's within a three-month period. So if you're a December year-end uh, plan, it's hopeful that the SOC reports come in with a September 30th, uh, 30th date or later, closer to your plan, not there may be some additional work required from your auditor or or additional inquiry from those supplying the SOC report. And a lot of time what's available out there, because we'll see a lot of times, especially given the time of what when an audit takes place, is there, there's uh, reports that are actually called gap reports. So they may fill in the blank for the period of time that they may, may be missing. Uh, so that may not be a full-blown uh, uh, audit or SOC 1 report, but there'll be a gap report mainly saying whether there's any changes in that uh, period of time that uh, would get through, again, that three-month window that would be required. Electronic audit evidence, uh, you know, there's been uh, a lot more in the way of uh, electronic audit evidence that's been supplied out there, and really has been taken into consideration in terms of what needs to happen with that electronic data, and if uh, the, the information that's been provided is, is in that form, there's additional testing that's required by the auditor. And really, the focus has been around two areas uh, in, in relation to that. Um, the, the, the needs to be test of the clerical accuracy of the electronic data, but uh, the focus has been on the completeness of that data um, and making sure that uh, you know uh, that data that's uh, been uh, supplied is, is complete. Uh, moving on to journal entries, and you know, I, I think that a lot of people think that uh, they've got an employee benefit plan, and you know, really, there's no general ledger. In, in many cases, and on those lines, there's you know no uh, journal entries that would really be uh, required. However, as you'll probably see from your auditor, it's a required step in any audit is to focus on journal entries. And although it may not take uh, place in terms of a general ledger um, or, or transactions, uh, there's a lot of detail that's within a trust uh, report and uh, slide by the record keeper um, that uh, accounts for all the transactions that happened during the year. There's requirements uh, from an audit perspective and really from a plan sponsor perspective to uh, understand what that data is. Um, and there needs to be tests that take uh, place over that. So uh, the biggest thing that uh, we find difficulty out there is many of the acronyms that takes place 
sheets and you know, this, uh, the, the system uh, or report generated type of coding that takes place and making sure there's an understanding of that. Uh, often cases we'll find within a trust report that there's transactions that uh, or corrections that may take place that can put a lot of red flags and problems out there. So making sure that you're getting those participant uh, reports, those trustee reports, and going through to make sure that you understand all the time transactions that occurred during a year. Uncashed checks, again, Jay talked about this before, but you know, this happened for, for you know, various reasons. The you know, check was never received by the participant, it was lost, or in many cases the participant for whatever reason chose not to cash. And really making sure that you have an understanding of what those uncashed checks are. Uh, we found many times as part of our audit that uh, really able to get the details of what those checks are. Um, if that's if, if that is a material amount, or if that detail is unable to be found, uh, it will result in as much of a sco as a scope limitation, so really affecting your your filing your 5500. And the other thing is that uh, really relates to deficiency that would be there that would need to be evaluated related to a plan's internal controls. So, uh, so that's on cash checks, auditors communications. Jay's talked about that. Uh, the guidance for that is AU 260. There are requirements out there that need to be made with audit committee. So again, if you're not receiving uh, letters from your auditors, uh, that could be a problem. I also touched on excess revenue agreements. Uh, if plans have these in place, really the focus needs to be on how the plan intends to use these type of uh, arrangements. Uh, these need to be uh, used to, to reduce plan expenses, you know, allocated to participants, or do they expire? And what, what needs to happen is to make sure that these are recorded on the financial statements correctly. Um, again, you know, if these are out there not being used or, or, or really not being focused on, uh, this is a hot topic that's out there that could get you in trouble. Like, uh, or I'm sorry, for find benefit plans, we're seeing a lot of activity. We'll talk about uh, this on a slide later in terms of uh, you know, what's happening out there right now. But uh, the environment, uh, you know, is kind of out there for uh, this to be an area that uh, many plan sponsors are focusing on. Automatic plan features, this is also becoming more part of uh, plans, uh, but it's also a, 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 an area that we're finding a lot of problems. Uh, there's reasons why these are put in place. We understand the, uh, why these are put in place, uh, but you know, in relation to what happens is that effective date that occurs when these automatic plan provisions are put in place are not always actually occurring. So there's missed deferrals that are very common, and uh, that gets into, again, it, it may be a material amount, but you're dealing with participant money, and uh, if those uh, deferrals are not happening, there's uh, fees and penalties that go along with that. So you put these in place, you need to make sure that you have the internal controls uh, in place to be able to make sure that uh, uh, that effective date to, is being used and those deferrals are in place. A couple items, the Defense of Marriage Act, Affordable Care Act. Um, there's, uh, I'll, I'll say this, these are probably even more along the legal lines, making sure you're consulting uh, with your your, uh, your folks. Uh, any communications, notices, compliance need to be in place uh, with these items. And, you know, there's a lot of change in forms. And specifically to health and welfare plans, these are uh, something that we're seeing that's quite a bit out there. I think I go to a polling question uh, next. Make sure you get this down. Will these considerations have an impact on me if I'm not a plan auditor? A, yes, B, no, don't know, and D, may work, but uh, don't care. <laughs> Obviously, the answer out there is yes, um, and you'll probably feel the impact uh, in through your audit if an audit is required um, in uh, going through uh, and really supplying the auditor with everything that they need. And uh, if there's deficiencies out there in these areas, uh, you'll uh, most likely receive a deficiency type of letter. And again, in the worst case scenario, it could affect your audit opinion or your filing with the 5500. So, for polling question number three, your answer is A, yes. I think we have a question, Rob, if we want to go to that quick there. Somebody has brought a question, and I think it relates to um, uh, GAP letters, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Look at the letter. The question around bridge letters, and uh, if you have a bridge letter taking you from the the date uh, from SOC one uh, report to their end date, will those cover the issue? Yes. 
That's exactly what we were discussing before. Uh, you have that letter and can supply that letter that will get you, for instance, in a December 31st plan year, December 31st plan, uh, date, or at least through September 30th, that would get uh, the auditor comfort and would meet the requirements that you would have on your end uh, for running on those internal controls. Good question. Horizon. Uh, these are P the first uh, few here relate to PCOB uh, standards that are out there. Um, I'm not sure how many public companies we have in the the audience that have plans. But found with anything that uh, any to PCAB is issuing anything, eventually it seems like, like it's it to the private companies in the form of standards. Um, so you know, even though you may be a private company, to make sure that uh, you're paying attention to these PCAB standards that may be out there. Uh, First one relates to supplemental information. Uh, if you have supplemental financial information, most of you do, that would be in the back. Those now are considered as part of the audit. Uh, again, effective for financial statements uh, ending uh, on or after June 1st, so the year that we're now. Uh, using the work of internal audits and internal auditors, there's been all clarified standards that have been out there. In most cases, we find these don't affect uh, many of our employee benefit plans, but if they do, uh, feel free to, to, to look into that or ask as questions. Um, and then PCOB and IAASB reporting uh, proposals. Uh, there should have been uh, changes in terms of the audit opinion that's out there that's resulting in additional procedures. Um, so some of that out there and, and again on the horizon. Jay Batten was talking a little bit about here the Clarity Project. More standards coming out. So uh, again, I think that these slides will uh, you know, continue to be out there in relation to the what's out there uh, for uh, required audit procedures. Um, again, independence rules to, uh, that, that uh, we out there to affiliates, interpreting 101-18. Jay talked a little bit about this. But really what this did is clarified which entities are affiliates of a test client and subject AICPA independence provisions. Really a lot of focus out there on independence. Economic uh, considerations and trends. Uh, we'll talk a little bit here in, on the next few slides about uh, specifically defined benefit plans, terminating and freezing plans, underwriting situations, changes in assumptions, and uh, defined contribution plans. We talked a little bit already about auto enrollment uh, and, and what's been happening out there. Again, uh, all the trends that we're seeing, and then key disclosures. A couple bullets on there fraud considerations. Um, I think that uh, you know we always talk about this with our clients. We talk about this as a firm fraud, and a lot of times I get the question back that says, you know, "How could a fraud really occur within a defined benefit plan audit when there's so much reliance on, on third parties?" And we have uh, you know the reports that would be out there that uh, uh, don't have their controls. Uh, one that uh, we see all the time and read about is you're dealing with payroll, you're de dealing with benefit payments, and specifically in those two areas is a lot of times where you'll see fraud. Um, and sometimes it has to do with segregation of duty, and, and especially on the payroll side, and also the ability to change where that check or distribution checks are going. Um, the, the last, uh, the last uh, bullet on that is paperless environment, privacy, and security challenges. I think that we're seeing this is one of the biggest risks that uh, it would be out there. Is you know everything's online now, so uh, everything's becoming very paperless. We're seeing very few of our clients that uh, uh, aren't set up in a way that's mostly paperless. Uh, move to the next slide. Uh, terminating freezing defined benefit plans. Again, a very uh, hot topic that's out there and a trend that we're seeing going through one right now. The only thing I can say is that it's a very long process. Uh, discount rates uh, really back up. Plan asset values going up. We're seeing a lot of the plan sponsors saying, is this the right time for me to terminate my my the benefit plan, and uh, they're starting that process again. Takes some time. Uh, the client that I'm going through this right now, it's an 18 month process minimum. Uh, and their recommendation, my recommendation, would be to start early because, as we talk about here, there's a required participant regulatory communication, and that needs to happen uh, <clears throat> right off the bat. That needs to happen right away. A lot of clients with applicable regulations, qualification issues situation where there may be insufficient funds that's out there. So uh, again, I would uh, suggest starting early and then really making sure you're working with your TPAs and, and your legal counsel um, to make sure that uh, you're handling all these the right way because you can. there's a lot of pitfalls that are out there. 
The, other, the impact that I'll point out here, and this isn't so much on the plan side, but the plan sponsor side, is that when you go through a termination, there could be a pretty big impact to your income statement. Is uh, you know you would go through a termination. You have amounts that sit in uh, comprehensive income, and those amounts uh, would need to be considered in relation to, to rolling through and hitting your income statement when you go through the actual settlement date with the termination. Uh, and contribution plans. Uh, again, we're seeing participant contributions rates higher, auto enrollment going higher. A lot of times we see those coinciding with the economy. And again, with the, as the economy's improved, uh, we're, we, we've seen uh, those trends. Investments, which are popular, mutual funds, collective, insurance contracts. Really, the trend we're seeing is a lot more avoidance of level three. I think with all the publicity and requirements that are out there on, on level three assets. Uh, you know, there's been more and more of trying to avoid those type of assets out, out there. Benefits to plan participants. Uh, many of you might be seeing this, but uh, you know, we've we've seen the benefits really been increasing. I think during the recession, a lot of those benefits were taken away, uh, but the matches are back. The benefits are up, and especially as there's a quest to find qualified workers, uh, you know, that's just become part of the game out there. So uh, participants are looking more and more at the benefits that are out there under the, the, the defined contribution plans. You talked about benchmarking of fees. Did the, this affect uh, employee behavior and participation? You know, we work with a lot of our plans and uh, uh, benchmarking these fees. Um, in any cases, we found that the fees were too high out there, and I think that, uh, especially on the TPA side, that there was, uh, you know, some, some room where, you know, that there were some eyes open and said, you know what, what am I really paying out here? So there's been there's been some good along with uh, a lot of the compliance that's uh, been been out there. One quick thing on that. Is, is to keep in mind that those fees are fees between the plan itself and supplying a service to that plan. Not necessarily fees paid by the sponsor. So if the sponsor pays on behalf of the plan, that would not be subject to these benchmarking fees. So the key is, is to think about it as fees paid out of the plan itself. Uh, reposures. The other thing I'll point out here, uh, as companies have continued to hire, uh, the participants has uh, continued to go up, and uh, there's been a lot of new audit requirements that's been out there. A lot of people think that uh, the, the 100 participants kind of the magic mark. It gets a little bit more complex than that. Uh, it's still a good benchmark to use, but uh, if you've been hiring and that you're, I, I would say, kind of a benchmark to use, you're starting to get above 80. You get above 120 is really trying to make sure you're working with uh, uh, GPA to make sure if you need an audit out there. So we've seen a lot of new audits that have been uh, required based on the number of participants. A question out there that uh, is from Joseph. As an employee, employer, fiduciary with a retirement plan, should I request a copy of the audit report from the vendors that we do our investing and plan administration as fiduciary? Do we need to meet with the auditors to satisfy our fiduciary to the employer employees? I'd say we've probably not seen that a lot. Um, I don't think it's a bad idea to request that report there um, from vendors. You may or may not be able to get it. Uh, the biggest thing is again to try to get those SOC one reports. Uh, to the extent that you're relying on them, uh, they, they they should most likely provide that. And really receive this that as if you have the level three investments that's out there. Uh, making sure that for that fund uh, to try to get the audit report for those. Do you have anything else? No, that, that uh, basically brings us to the end of our, our presentation. We've included our contact information here for you, so feel free to reach out to either one of us if you have any further uh, information you'd like clarity on. Again, we would really appreciate it if you could fill out the participant evaluation form and get back to us. And for you again, Seeking CD credit, you will need to form uh, complete the C verification form with appropriate information, and hopefully you were paying attention to the three verification questions and got those answers. Uh, we don't have any other questions at this point in time, so I think we're going to go ahead and sign off. But we appreciate you for participating, and uh, everybody have a great day. Thank you.